I don't happen to think that's the case. So I'm still very worried uh, about I think there is a significant probability, high above zero, that in the next 18 months, we will see this president decide to launch an attack or respond to some provocation, uh, an attack by the Israelis, or something by uh, a terror attack or something, and go after Iran with even greater uh, catastrophic effects than the attack of Iraq. And third, I've been describing most of this time a real crisis to our constitution. Now, uh, I don't have time, but I've, I've pretty much indicated where I think that is. If someone were to say that crisis is over, it's not a crisis now. The Democrats have accepted it. We're going to have a precedent for years for this stuff. It's not being opposed. It would be hard to, um, to oppose that. It's too late. Chalmers Johnson thinks that, I think. He's saying, in effect, what E.P. Thompson says, in a, to paraphrase Chalmers Johnson and Nemesis, we don't have a military-industrial complex. We are a military-industrial complex and that that's so deeply embedded in every precinct and so contradictory uh, as an imperial project. So the empire is so deep into our economy and our culture, into our minds now, there's really no going back. That's what he thinks. I can't accept that. First of all, nothing is that certain. Nothing is certain. And uh, though that's too great a certainty. Second, where the stakes are this high, that it's worth struggling very hard. And struggling how? I'll mention one way that apply, or I, I can generalize it. Is though, if some of you have read my article in Harper's last October, you can see it on my website, ellsberg.net. Harper's article last, but the theme of that is, I believe that people who know of the plans for a catastrophe, what they see is a catastrophic, plan in Iran, a new war, or for that matter, the continuation of this war, but especially a new war, which is easier to stop than one that's going on, should consider doing what, not what I did, doing what I wish I had done years earlier in 1964-65 when I was in the Pentagon, before I went to Vietnam as a member of the State Department for two years. But when I was in the Pentagon and knew that Lyndon Johnson was lying to the public in every aspect of the war before the Tonkin Gulf Resolution and after the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, I had those documents in my safe. I wish I had done what Wayne Morse told me would have averted the war. He was the one who voted against the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, but there were only two at that point. He said, if you had given me those documents after I had put them out years later in 1971, he said, if you'd given those to me at the time, 1964, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution would never have gone, come out of committee. And if they had bypassed the committee and gone to the floor, it would never have passed. Well, that's a heavy burden to, to bear. And I'm telling people in the, in the administration right now, you don't have to bear that burden. You do have an alternative and it might put you in prison now, and it might have put me in prison, it was likely, but, even, but now it's even more likely. Why not? Why should not an official be willing to risk prison to avert the deaths of uncountable numbers of Iranians, Iraqis, and American troops in ways that would decrease our security enormously as Iraq has decreased their security? Why should not? Uh, some of these people were in the military. I was in Iraq, I was in Vietnam as a civilian, but I used my marine training to go into combat, to observe. And I saw courage all around me. Everybody risking their lives for the orders, for their teammates, for whatever. It was, it was uh, expected of them, and they had it all had it in them. Why could not an official be asked by you, by us, to be willing to risk their clearance, their career, their job. These are not light things. This is not something you do routinely. You don't do it every time the government lies. You wouldn't stay in government for a day or a week, if that. But when the lies involve this many lives and this catastrophe to our Constitution, because I think in a war with Iran or the next 9-11, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights will go the way of the Weimar Republic, just be swept away in a day. 
So there's enormous emphasis on averting that. And what's new for me is to apply the same standard to Congress. When as Senator Durbin tells us, I knew in 2002 everything that's come out since. We were told the truth on the Intelligence Committee, but I couldn't tell them because I had promised secrecy. I'll end with this last thought. They've all forgotten the oath that every member of Congress took, that every member of the service took, every civilian official took, which is to protect and uphold the Constitution, to defend and uphold the Constitution. It's not an oath to the leader, to the Fuhrer, to the Commander-in-Chief, to superior officers. It is to the Constitution, period. Now, I don't think, and I've discussed this with Krogh, it ever occurred to us that there could be a conflict between that oath and our sense of loyalty to our boss, to our agency, to the, to the government department, to, above all to the president. How could there be a conflict? Well, there can. There was. I violated that oath every day, every day that I held on to those documents in the Pentagon, knowing that Congress had been lied to, knowing that we were lying not only into a war, but into an unwinnable, wrongful war, neo-colonial war, hopeless, endless, and so forth. I went along with that. That's true of everybody in the Pentagon right now, every congressperson, and as Bob Shear says, the journalists who show, and I've seen this in combat, incredible courage in facing fire. They don't wear a helmet because it interferes with their camera. Horse Foss, I used to see that all the time. But back home, a boss, their stories get spiked, the line comes, they don't risk careers. Risk lives, but not careers. That's the theme that we're raised in. Okay, I'm saying it does go against our oath. The Constitution that we take an oath to in the officials and that people here, I invite you to take very seriously so long as we haven't gotten back to the Articles of Confederation. But with the Constitution, should be taken seriously. I think that the people who wrote that and who earlier said that they would pledge their lives, their honor, their sacred honor, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor for a government without a king, without a king. We're right to do so. It's right to take those risks now. And what comes down to Iraq, when I describe a future that the Democrats are buying onto at this point, well, the least bad outcome is to keep in those bases and for this reason or that reason, to ignore the fact that that is an indefinite, illegal occupation of a country that does not want to be occupied and that will uh, fire at us and do IEDs forever, as long as we're there. And I would say as a moral matter, the United States, by the lives we have lost and the lives we have taken, we have bought no right, we've gained no right to decide by fire and bombing who shall live and who shall govern in Iraq. The United States must stop killing Iraq.